Hello, I'm Dr. Arthur Bradley, author of the Handbook to Practical Disaster Preparedness for the Family. Today I'd like to talk to you about inverters. Now, we've all experienced the loss of electrical power, probably due to storms. It seems like utility power is always the first thing to fail. So many people keep generators on hand just for that reason. However, if you live in an apartment building, for example, you might not be able to use a generator. So you need some other option. An excellent alternative is to use something known as an inverter. Now, inverters have several advantages and a few disadvantages when compared with generators. For one thing, they're much smaller than generators, and they don't require any fuel, so they don't produce any poisonous fumes and very little noise. They're also much less expensive than generators. However, their primary limitation is they just don't provide the same output power that generators do, so you have to plan accordingly when you use inverters. Now, I set out three different inverters, and I'd like to talk to each just briefly. The first one is an automobile inverter. In this case, you have a cigarette lighter plug on one end and a single AC outlet on the other end. This type of device is really meant for like recharging a cell phone or, or perhaps recharging a flashlight. Plug one end into your cigarette lighter, plug the recharger into the other end. Very useful, but it doesn't provide a lot of output power. This particular unit is rated at 150 watts. Enough to do what you need to do in a car, but not nearly enough for home use. The second one I have set out is a 1000 watt unit by Vectormax. Uh, in this particular case, you would wire it up to a large lead acid battery hopefully preferably a deep discharge marine battery because they tend to last longer when you continually cycle them down in power. You wire from the battery directly into the input terminals and then you plug in your electrical load into the AC outlets on the other end. Very simple, very straightforward. This one's rated at 1000 watts so it would provide enough power to let's say run a microwave oven or several lights. Finally, I set out a larger inverter. This one is a 2500 watt inverter, also by Vectormax. What's important about this unit is that it also has a 5,000 watt peak rating for surge currents. Anything with an electrical motor tends to draw a lot of current when it first powers up, so a good example of that might be a refrigerator or a washing machine. These type units are meant to provide power to those heavier loads, so this is an excellent option for home use. You notice that the input side has larger connections for the battery, and on the output side there are three AC outlets. Useful if you want to perhaps provide power to lights, perhaps power to your refrigerator, and perhaps power to the microwave. You can distribute it out to different loads. Now, one thing I want to point out is anytime you use an inverter, you have to be careful to use the appropriate size wire to wire between the battery and the inverter. In the case of the 1000 watt inverter, perhaps using like a 6 or 8 gauge set of wires would be perfectly adequate. However, if you're going to use a very large inverter, like this 2500 watt inverter, you might end up having to use quite a bit larger wires. Now, these particular wires might be a little bit overkill, but it's better to have wires that are a little large than too small because if they're too small they can get hot and eventually pose a fire hazard. Now what I'd like to do is wire up one of these inverters to a couple of loads and then I'll walk you through the process of how that's done. Alright, I've taken a couple minutes to wire up an inverter. I wanted to talk to you about those connections. So the first thing you notice is I've got the large gel cell marine di deep discharge battery here. Now, the advantage of a deep discharge battery like this one over, say, a conventional car lead acid battery is that it's really designed with thicker plates inside which allow you to discharge it repeatedly without causing any damage. In a pinch, however, a standard car battery will do fine. I used the heavy gauge wire that we talked about earlier. If you use wire that's too small, what you'll notice is that it'll start to heat up, and that's a good indication that you need to swap to heavier gauge wire. Those connections are made to the input side of the inverter. The red goes to the positive terminal, the black goes to the negative terminal. Now, it's real important that you pay attention when you connect those because if you connect them backwards, some inverters will be destroyed. Finally, on the output side, we have three of the standard AC plugs, and in this case I've plugged in both a toaster and a small lamp just for this demonstration. So let's go ahead and turn it on. And the first thing you'll notice is that a fan turns on inside the inverter. Now that fan is to help dissipate the heat. Like any electrical appliance, the inverter is not 100% efficient. Typical efficiencies might be about 85 to 90%, which means the other 10 or 15% has to be dissipated as heat. That's why we have the large fins on the unit here. We've got the two devices plugged in, the toaster and the lamp. We'll go ahead and power those up. And you, just, you see that they operate just fine. They, together, they take about 900 watts of power. This inverter is rated at 2,500 watts, so well within its capability. I wouldn't expect to see a lot of heating of this inverter with this load. I'll go ahead and turn everything back off. One thing that 
often comes up is people want to know well, how do you properly size an inverter for your loads and there's a couple ways to do that the easiest way is to just look at the product label sheet oftentimes on the bottom of the, the particular appliance so like on the bottom of the toaster it indicates that it takes 850 watts of power a lamp would be the power consumption would be determined by the type of bulb you use perhaps a 40 or 60 watt bulb so together these two are just over 900 watts in some cases however though you can't find a data sheet on the unit or maybe it's very difficult to get access to that's when these devices uh, a meter perhaps like this kilowatt meter are particularly helpful now the kilowatt meter is very simple you plug it into a standard uh, outlet and then you plug the device into the front side and it will measure the, the voltage that's applied the current that the device uses and the power that the device uses very handy when trying to properly size an inverter so in this case I'll plug it in and I'll go ahead and take the the toaster here and plug it into there and it measures it and says that there's about 123 volts coming out of the wall I'll power up the toaster and I'll go ahead and switch over to the power setting and it measures about 865 watts to the toaster when it's operating very close to what the product sheet said now I do want to talk about uh, a few features that are important when selecting an inverter the first is that just like I mentioned before some inverters if you accidentally reverse the polarity of the input you'll destroy the inverter uh, others however are reverse polarity protected they actually detect that you've connected backwards and they won't power up and they'll protect themselves that's a nice feature to have likewise on the output side the output can be protected against a short circuit so for example you have a defective appliance where the two wires end up touching one another and short circuiting if the inverter is not able to detect that short circuit it will continue to drive power out and may well represent a fire danger however many inverters are short circuit protected as is this one when they see a short circuit outside they will immediately and automatically shut down which is a great safety feature finally there are inverters that produce true sine wave outputs and others that produce modified sine wave outputs in this case this is a modified sine wave output inverter and that's probably fine from, for nearly any appliance however if you were powering up something that was very sensitive to the quality of the input power perhaps a high fidelity stereo or a very expensive computer system you might want to opt for the more expensive true inverter sine wave uh, so overall though this is a few hundred dollar kind of investment that is an excellent method of providing electrical power to a broad range of equipment again you can't provide power to let's say a large refrigerator or uh, something like a washing machine because the surge currents might well exceed the 5000 watts however for most things it will do the job and it's excellent for people that live in apartments or other places where you can't put a large generator